Girls got it right, man. I'm wearing the Snuggie still, and um, it's just the top. I'm not wearing any pants, so I'm letting Young Johnson hang out kind of loose down by my knees, you know. But anyway, it's just, just the top. It's like wearing a full dress with sleeves. Girls got it. This is so comfortable. I'm shocked. If only, if this wasn't, if this was socially acceptable, this is my fit. Every day, I'm making y'all look at my legs. I'm a six foot five. I'm very tall. Look at my legs. They're beautiful. Anyways, welcome back to Demian uh, by by uh, Ellen. That's right. Ellen DeGener. Um, we'll be starting on chapter two called Cain. In the previous chapter, um, young Demian, which is harassed by an older bully fellow. He was 10 at the time. Um, this is somewhat of a continuation of the previous chapter, breaking into some new territory. With a name like Cain, one might wonder how this relates to the Bibble, right? And, uh, oh, he killed him. <laughs> um, without further ado, let's get started. Don't forget to like, favorite, comment, subscribe, and, uh, Sleepers Tales. Let's get to the reading. Chapter 2, Cain. Salvation from my tormentor came from a totally unexpected quarter, and at the same time, I was conscious of a new element in my life, which has affected me right up to the present day. A new boy had just joined our school. He was the son of a well-to-do widow who had come to live in our town, and he wore a mourning band on his sleeve. He was placed in a higher class than mine, and was several years older, but he soon impressed me, as he impressed everybody else. This remarkable boy seemed older than he looked. He did not seem, in fact, like a boy at all. He moved among us, more childish members of the school, strangely mature, like a man or rather a gentleman. He was not popular, and he took no part in games, still less in the general rough and tumble, and if it was only the firm, self-confident tone he adapted in his attitude towards the masters that won him favor with the other boys. And he called himself... Max Demian. Oh, excuse me, the main character's name is not Demian, something else. What is it again? Uh. One day, as happened now and again, an additional class was put in our large classroom, for one reason or another, and it was Demian's. We junior boys were having a scripture lesson, and the senior boys had to write an essay. While we were being told the story of Cain and Abel, I kept glancing over towards Demian, whose face held a peculiar fascination for me. And I observed his bright, clever, unusually resolute face bend diligently over his work. He looked less like a schoolboy doing his prep than a research student absorbed in some individual problem of his own. He did not attract me. I was conscious, on the contrary, of a certain antipathy between us. He was too self-possessed and cool, too defiantly confident. His eyes had a grown-up expression which never commends them to young people, and faintly sad, with flashes of derision. But I could not help staring at him whether I liked him or not. Hardly had he given me one glance. However, when I immediately averted my head in panic, and when I think back to it today, and now he looked as a schoolboy, I can certainly confirm that he was different from all the rest, in every respect. An individual wholly in his own right, with his own personality, stamped on him. Therefore, though he made every effort not to impress, he bore himself and behaved in every way like a prince, moving about among peasants, incognito, and taking great pains to look like them. He was walking behind me on the way home from school, when the others had run off. He caught me up and greeted me. Even his style of greeting, despite the fact that he imitated our schoolboy tone of voice, was grown up and courteous. Shall we walk along together for a while? He asked amiably. I was flattered and nodded. Then I described to him where I lived. Oh, there, he smiled. I know the house. An odd thing has been built in above your front entrance. It has always intrigued me. I had no idea what he was alluding, and I was amazed that he apparently knew our house better than I did myself. The keystone of the arch had certainly a coat of arms on it, but... It had been worn smooth during the centuries, and had often been painted over. As far as I know, it had nothing to do with ourselves and our family history. I don't know anything about it, I said shyly. It's a bird or something of the sort. 
It must be quite ancient. The house is supposed to have belonged to a monastery in the old days. That might well be so, he said, nodding. Have a good look at it. I think the bird is a sparrowhawk. We walked on, and I felt very constrained. And suddenly, Nadimin laughed as if something comic had occurred to him. <laughs> yes, I was there during your lesson, he burst out. The story of Cain who bore the mark on his forehead, wasn't it? Do you like it? N no. It was rare for me to like anything we had to learn. I did not, however, dare to confess it, for I felt I was being addressed by a grown-up. I said I liked the story quite well. Demon slapped me on the back. You don't need to put on an act for me, dear chap. All the same, the story really is very remarkable. Much more so than most of the other stories that are taught in class. And the teacher did not say much about it, just the usual comment about God and sin and so on, but I believe. He broke off and asked with a smile, But are you interested? It, yes, I believe then. And he continued, That this story of Cain can be interpreted differently. Most of the stories we are taught are valid and authentic, but it is possible to see them from another angle than that of the teacher's and it gives them much more sense. You can't feel satisfied with this cane, for example, and with the mark on his forehead as they explain it to us. Don't you agree? Someone may certainly kill his own brother in a quarrel, and he may panic afterwards and eat humble pie, but that he should be marked with a special sign for his cowardice, that acts as a kind of protection and inspires fear in everybody else. Strange indeed. It is, I said, becoming interested in the subject. But what other interpretation could give one the story? He struck me on the shoulder again. And quite simple. What happened and lay behind the whole origin of the story was the sign. Here was a man who had something in his face that frightened other people. They did not dare lay hands on him. He impressed them, he and his children. It is virtually certain that he bore no actual mark on his brow like a postmark. The real life isn't as crude as that. Rather, there is some hardly perceptible mark. A little more intelligence and self-possession in his eyes than people were accustomed to. This man had power, and they all went in awe of him. He had a sign. You can explain that how you will. People always want whatever's comfortable and puts them in the right. They are afraid of Cain's children. They bore a sign. So the sign was not interpreted for what it really was, but the contrary. They said that people with the sign were odd, as indeed they were. Men of courage and character always seem very sinister to the rest. It was a sinister thing that to breed a strange, fearless people should be going on about. And so they attached a nickname and a myth to this family as a way of taking revenge and ridding themselves of guilt for all the fear they had experienced. Do you see? M yes. That means that Cain was not really evil? And the whole Bible story isn't really authentic. Well, yes and no. These ancient stories are always true in a sense, but they are not always properly recorded or given a correct interpretation. In short, I consider Cain to be a fine fellow, and they pinned this story on him merely because they were afraid of him. And the story had its basis in hearsay. The kind of thing people bandy about, and it was true, insofar as Cain and his children really bore some kind of mark and were different from the other people. I was astounded. And do you believe in the business of the slang? It isn't true either, I asked, fascinated. Oh yes, that's certainly true. The strong man slew the weak. But we may well doubt whether it was his brother. It isn't important. Ultimately... All men are brothers. And thus, a strong man slew a weak man. And perhaps it was the deed of a hero. And perhaps not. At all events, the other weaklings were now filled with fear. Complained bitterly when they were asked, Why do you not slay him too? They did not reply. Because we are cowards. But we cannot. He has a sign. God hath branded him. The fraud must have originated somehow like that. But I'm keeping you. Goodbye then. He turned into the elk gas and left me standing there, more baffled than I'd ever been before in my life. Almost as soon as he had gone, everything he said seemed utterly incredible. Cain, a noble man, 
Abel, a coward. The brand of Cain, a mark of distinction? It was absurd. He was blasphemous and wicked. Where had God been? Had he not accepted Abel's sacrifice? Did he not love Abel? No, it was all nonsense. Demon had wanted to fool me. Lead me on and get me into trouble. He was a devilish clever fellow. He could talk, but he couldn't put that one over. I had never before given so much as thought to the Bible, or for any story of that matter. It was a long time since I'd forgotten Franz Cromer so completely, for the hours, for a whole evening in fact. At home, I read the story once again as it was written in the Bible. It was short and unambiguous, and I was quite mad to look for any special hidden meaning. At that rate, any murderer could masquerade as a favored one of God. No, it was nonsense. It was just Demon's easy and attractive way of telling these things, as if everything were self-evident. And then that look in his eyes. There's something very wrong with me. I had lived in a wholesome and unsullied world. I had been a kind of able. Now I was stuck so deeply in the other world. I had fallen and sunk, and yet, at heart, I could not really help it. How was this? And now, memory flashed through my mind, which left me almost breathless. On that fatal evening, when my present trouble had begun and had been with my father, I had suddenly seen through his world of light and wisdom. Indeed, I, myself, who was Cain and bore that sign, had imagined that the sign was nothing to be ashamed of but a distinction, rather that because of my wickedness and misfortune, I stood higher than my father, higher than the pious and righteous. I did not think the matter out as definitely as that, but... My thought was composed of all these elements. It was a stirring of strange emotions that hurt me and filled me with the pride at the same time. When I considered how strangely Demian had spoken of the fearless and the cowards, how oddly he had interpreted the signs on Cain's brow, how his remarkable adult eyes had lit up, the question flashed through my mind. Whether this Demian himself was not a kind of Cain? Why did he defend him? If he didn't share that same feeling... Why had he this power in his eyes? Why did he speak so scornfully of the others, the timid souls who, after all, were the pious and chosen ones of the Lord? These thoughts went around and round in my head. It was a stone dropped into a well, and the well was my youthful soul. And for a long time, this matter of Cain, the murder, and the sign formed an outlet for my attempts at recognition, my doubts, and criticism. I observed that Demian exercised a fascination over the other boys, too. I had not breathed a word to anyone about the cane business, but the rest also seemed to be interested in him. At all events, there are many rumors in circulation about the new boy. If I only knew them all, I thought each one would throw some light on his character and have some significance. But I merely knew that Demian's mother was reported to be very wealthy. It was also said that neither she nor her son ever attended church. One boy wondered whether they might not be Jews at all, but they could equally well be Mohammedans, or Muslims, in a, in twenty the year 2000 speak. Tales were also current of Max Demian's physical prowess. He certainly had been greatly humiliated the strongest boy in class who had challenged him to a fight, and called him a coward when he refused to fight. Those who were present said Demian had just taken him by the scruff of the neck with one hand and squeezed hard, whereupon the boy had gone white and crept off. He was unable to use his arm for days afterwards. The whole of one evening, it was rumored that he had died. For a time, no assertion was too extravagant to be believed, and everything about him was amazing and exciting. Then, they had enough, temporarily at any rate. Now much later... There was further gossip among us. Some boys reported that Demian associated with girls and knew everything. Meanwhile, my business with Franz Cromer followed its inevitable course. I could not escape him. For even when he left me in peace for a few days, I was still bound to him. He haunted my dreams like my own shadow. Any spell that he failed to cast over me in reality, my imagination allowed him to cast in those dreams in which I became utterly his slave. I lived in them. I was always a great dreamer, and I used up my health and strength more in these shadows than in real life. The recurrent nightmare was that Cromer was torturing me, 
spitting and, and kneeling on me, and what was worse, leading me on to serious crimes, or rather, not so much leading me on as compelling me by sheer force of personality. The most horrible acts, those nightmares from which I could not wake, was half crazy. It was a murderous attack on my father. Cromer sharpened a blade and put it in my hand, and we stood behind the trees of an avenue, lying in wait for someone. But when that person approached, and Cromer conveyed to me by pinching my arm that this was the man I had to stab, I saw that it was my father. Then I would wake up. Although preoccupied with these things, I certainly did still think about Cain and Abel, but I gave a little thought to Demian. When he first approached me, it was, oddly enough, likewise in a dream. Once again, I was dreaming of torture and violence, of which I was the victim, but this time it was Demian who knelt on me. And this was a new feature, and deeply impressed me. Everything that I had resisted, and that had caused me pain when Cromer was my tormentor, I suffered gladly at Demian's hands, with a feeling compounded as much of ecstasy as of fear. I dreamed it twice, but the third time I found Franz back in his accustomed role. I have long been unable to separate what I experienced in these dreams from the reality. Be that as it may, my relations with Cromer followed their course and were not at an end when I had paid off the sum owing to him with the fruits of my petty thefts. No. He now knew about these thefts, for he pestered me with questions about the source of the money, and I was more in his hands than ever. He frequently threatened to tell my father everything, but even then, my fear was hardly as great as my profound regret that I had not told father myself at the beginning. Meantime, miserable though I was, I did not regret it at all, at least not the whole time. Sometimes, I believe that it was fated to happen in this way. My destiny hung over me, and it was useless for me to try to escape. Presumably, my parents were considerably distressed while the situation continued. A strange spirit had come over me. I no longer fitted into our community, with which I had previously been so closely bound up, and I was often overcome with a wild hankering for it, or some kind of lost paradise. My mother, it was true, treated me more like a wayward than a sick child but I was better able to judge from my sister's attitude how matters really stood. This attitude of extreme indulgence towards me caused me infinite distress because it made it plain to me that I was considered as one in some way possessed, more to be pitied than blamed for his condition, but one, nevertheless, in whom the devil had taken up his quarters. I felt that they were praying for me more than ever before, and I was conscious of the futility of their prayers. I often felt a burning need for relief, a longing for sincere confession, but I knew in advance that I would be unable to tell and explain it properly, either to my mother or father. I knew that it would all be accepted sympathetically, that they would be sorry for me, but would not understand that the whole thing would be regarded as an aberration, whereas, in truth, it was fate. I realize that many people will be unable to credit a child, not even eleven years old, with such feelings, but... This story is not intended for them. I am recounting it to those who have better understanding of human nature. The grown-ups, who has learned to translate a part of his feelings into thoughts, misses these thoughts in the child, and therefore finally denies even the experiences themselves. But I have rarely felt and suffered more deeply than in that time. One rainy day, I had been ordered by my tormentor to go to the town square there I stood and waited, shuffling my feet along the wet chestnut leaves that were still falling from the wet trees. I had not any money, but had two pieces of cake on one side to take along, so that at any rate I might be able to give Cromer something. I was used to standing in a corner and waiting for him. Often, for a very long time, and I put up with it. In that way, one learns to tolerate the inevitable. At length... Kramer came up to me. He did not stay long. He dug me in the ribs a few times, and laughed, and took the cake. He even offered me a damp cigarette, and was more friendly than usual. Ah, yes, he said, as he was leaving me. Before I forget, you might bring your sister along next time. Your elder sister, I mean. What's her name, by the way? I failed to grasp his point and made no reply. I looked at him surprised. Don't you get me? 
You are to bring your sister. Yes, Kramer, but it's no good. I won't be allowed to do so. and She wouldn't come in any case. His proposal did not surprise me. I saw it for what it was. The ruse, a pretext. It was the sort of thing he was always doing. Demanding the impossible. Frightening and humiliating me, and then gradually relenting. I had to buy myself off with money or some gift. This time, however, he was quite different. He was scarcely angry at me at all for my refusal. Well, he remarked perfunctorily, think it over. I'd like to meet your sister. All you need to do is bring her out here for a walk, and then I'll come up to you. I'll whistle for you tomorrow, and then we can discuss it again. When he had gone, something of the nature of his request suddenly dawned on me. I was still completely a child in these matters, but I knew from hearsay that boys and girls, when they were a little older, could do certain secret and improper things together. It flashed on me, all at once, how monstrous it was. My resolution never to be part of such a thing was made on the spot. But what would happen, and how Kramer would take his revenge on me, I did not dare to think. It was the beginning of some martyrdom for me. There were still worse things from that in store. Inconsolable, I walked across the empty square with my hands in my pockets, further torments and slavery. I had reached that point in my thoughts when a deep, cheerful voice hailed me. I was startled and began to run. Someone was pursuing me. A hand fell gently on my shoulder from behind. It was Max Demian. I capitulated. But, oh, it's you, I said doubtfully. You gave me such a fright. He looked at me. Never had his expression seemed more like that of a grown-up, a superior and perceptuous being than at that moment. We had not spoken to each other for a long time. Oh, I'm sorry, he said in his polite yet firm way. But look here, you wanted to let yourself be frightened like that. But you can't always help it. So it seems, but... See here, when you shrink back from someone who hasn't done you any harm, then that someone begins to think. And he's surprised. It makes him inquisitive. The someone thinks that you are remarkably nervous and comes to the conclusion that people are always like that when they're afraid. Cowards are always afraid, but I don't believe that you're a coward. Are you? Certainly. You aren't a hero either. There are some things that you're afraid of. And there are people two of whom you are afraid. But you oughtn't be. N no. One should never be afraid of any man. You're not afraid of me. Or are you? It, no, oh no, not at all. There you are. But there are people you are frightened of? Uh, I don't know. Leave me alone. What do you want? I quickened my pace with thoughts of flight, but he kept up with me, and I felt him glancing at me out of the corner of his eye. Let us assume, he began again, that I am well disposed towards you. At any rate, you've no need to be afraid of me. All right, then, I'd like to carry out an experiment with you. It was quite a light-hearted one, and you may learn something that will prove very useful. Listen, then. I often try out an art, which is known as thought reading. There's no black magic about it, but if you don't know how it's done, it seems uncanny. You can cause people considerable surprise, too. Well, we'll try the experiment. Now, I am fond of you, or interested in you, and I would like to discover what it's like inside you. I do this, and I've already taken the initial step. I frighten you. You are, therefore, in a nervous state. How does that come about? You don't need to be afraid of anybody. When you are afraid of someone, it means you've provided that someone with some kind of lever. You've done something wrong, for example, and the other person knows this, and by this means has acquired a hold over you. You understand. It's clear enough, isn't it? I looked up helplessly at his face, which was as serious and intelligent as ever, and good-natured, too. But there was no tenderness in his manner, which was severe. It had an element of righteousness, or something akin to it. I was hardly aware of what was happening to me. He stood over me like a magician. Have you got my meaning? He asked again. I nodded. And I was unable to speak. And I told you, thought reading seems comic, but it comes about quite naturally. 
And I could, for example, tell you pretty accurately what you thought about me when I once told you the story of Cain and Abel, but that has nothing to do with the present case. I also consider it possible that you once dreamed about me, but let's forget that too. You're bright, lad, and most of them are so stupid. I enjoy an occasional chat with an intelligent person in whom I can have confidence. Do you mind? Uh, of course not, but I don't understand. Let's keep to our lighthearted experiment. So, we've discovered this much. The boy, X, was frightened. He's afraid of someone. He probably shares a secret with him, this other fellow, which is very uncomfortable for him. Isn't that, roughly speaking, the situation? I succumbed to his voice and influence as in a dream. All I could do was nod. It was like a voice which one could only emanate from myself. A voice, indeed, that knew everything better and more clearly than myself. Demian slapped me on the back. So, that's what it is. I thought it might be. Now, just one question. Can you tell me the name of the boy who went off a few minutes ago? I was terrified. My threatened secret curled back inside me, afraid to come out again into the daylight. Uh, what kind of boy? There wasn't any boy here, only me. He laughed. Tell me, he laughed. What's his name? Do you mean Franz Cromer? I whispered. He gave a satisfied nod. <laughs> Good. You're a sensible chap. We'll become friends yet, but first, I must tell you something. This Cromer, or whatever his name is, is a rotter. I can tell by his face that he's a scoundrel. What do you think? Oh, yes. I sighed. He's a bad lot, all right. He's the devil himself, but he mustn't hear about this. For God's sake, he mustn't hear. Do you know him? Does he know you? Don't worry. He's gone off. He doesn't know me. Not yet. But I'd like to make his acquaintance. Does he go to the village school? Yes. What class? The top class. But don't say anything to him, please. Please, don't say anything. Don't worry. Nothing will happen to you. I don't suppose you'd care to tell me a bit more about this Cromer fellow. I can't. No, leave me. He was silent for a while. It's a pity, he said. We could have carried the experiment one stage further. But I won't torment you. But you do realize, don't you, that your fear of him is all wrong. A fear of that kind can be our ruin. We've got to get rid of it. You've got to get rid of it. And you must get rid of it. If you're going to be any good. Do you understand? It, certainly, you are quite right, but it's no good. You don't know. But you've seen that I know a good deal more than you thought. Do you owe him some money? It, yes, well, that was, well, that's not the main thing. I can't tell you. I just can't. Wouldn't it help, then, if I gave you the sum of money which you owe him? I could easily do so. No, it's not that, and I implore you not to say anything. It, it, nothing about it to anybody. Not a word. You're making me very unhappy. You can rely on me, Sinclair. You can tell me your secret some other time. Never, ever... I cried loudly. Just as you like. All I mean is that perhaps you may tell me more about it later. Voluntarily, of course. You don't think I'd behave like Cromer, I hope. Oh no, but you know practically nothing about it. Nothing at all. I'm merely thinking about it. And, believe me, I would never follow Cromer's example. And you don't owe me anything. We did not speak for a long time and I calmed down, but I found Demian's knowledge all the more puzzling. I'm going home now, he said, gathering his coat closer around him in the rain. There's just one more thing that I would like to say, since we've got so far. You ought to get rid of the fellow. If there's nothing else for him, kill him. I should be pleased and impressed if you did. I'd even lend you a hand. My fear returned again. The story of Cain suddenly recurred to me. The whole thing seemed sinister to me, and I began to weep silently. Too many strange things were going on around me. <laughs> Good then, laughed Max Demian. 
go home. You'll do something. Well, murder would be simplest. The simplest thing is always the best in such cases. You're in bad hands, friend Kramer. I found my way home. It felt as if I'd been away for a year. Everything looked different. Between me and Cromer stood something like the future, something of the nature of hope. I was no longer alone. And now, for the first time, I saw how terribly alone I had been with my secret all of those weeks. And something occurred to me, over which I had never pondered. That a confession of my parents would merely relieve me, without entirely redeeming me. Now, I had almost confessed to someone else, a stranger, and a feeling of relief rushed at me like a strong perfume. And for all that, my fear was still far from conquered, and I was prepared for a long series of terrifying disputes with my enemy. That was why it seemed remarkable that matters were being allowed to drift so discreetly and undisturbed. For a whole day, two, three days, a, a week, there was no sound of Kramer's whistle in front of our house. I could not believe it. I was continually on the watch in case he might suddenly reappear when he was least expected. But he continued to absent himself. Mistrustful of my new freedom, I could not really believe in it until at length I met Franz Kromer. He's coming towards me from the seal gas. When he saw me, his features were distorted in an ugly grimace, and, without more ado, he turned round in order to avoid meeting me. It was an astonishing moment for me. My enemy was running away from me. The devil was afraid of me. I felt a thrill of joy and surprise. Demian showed himself again during those days. He waited for me in front of the school. Hello, I said. Good morning, Sinclair. I only wanted to hear how you were getting on. Cromer's leaving you alone, isn't he? Are you responsible for that? But how then? How? I can't understand it. He's kept right away. That's good. If he should turn up again, I don't think he will, but he's an insolent fellow. Just tell him not to forget Demian. But what's the connection? Did you pick a quarrel with him and thrash him? No, I'm not keen on that sort of thing. I've merely been talking to him, as I did to you, and made it plain that it is to his advantage to leave you alone. Oh, but you haven't paid him any money? No, Sonny. You tried that method already. He made off. I badly wanted to question him, and I was left with the oppressive feeling he always gave me. It was an odd mixture of gratitude and awe admiration and fear, consent and inward hostility. I resolved to see him again, soon, so that I could discuss it all with him, and as well as the cane business, but this was not to be. Gratitude is certainly not a virtue that I believe in, and to expect it from a child would seem false. So the utter gratitude I showed towards Max Demian does not surprise me. Today I have no doubt whatsoever that I should never have recovered, but would have been ruined for life if he had not freed me from Cromer's clutches. Even at that time, I was conscious of this liberation as the greatest experience of my young life, but I deserted my liberator as soon as he had accomplished the miracle. There is nothing remarkable, as I have just affirmed, about my ingratitude. The one strange thing was my lack of curiosity. How was it possible for me to live another day without drawing any closer to the secrets from which Demian had brought me into contact? How could I resist the curiosity to hear more about Cain, more about Cromer, and more about thought reading? It was hardly comprehensible, and yet it was so. I suddenly saw myself extricated from the snares of the devil, and saw the world lying bright and joyful before me. I was no longer succumbing to attacks of fear and suffocating palpitations. The spell was broken, and I was no longer damned and tormented. I was a schoolboy again. My nature was striving to regain its equilibrium and composure, seeking above all else to put away from me and forget whatever was ugly and threatening. The whole long story of my guilt and fright was slipping away from my memory with incredible rapidity without leaving behind any scars or ill effects. I can also understand today what I was trying to forget my savior and helper with equal rapidity. From the valley of sorrows of my damnation, and from the frightful slavery of Cromer, 
I was flaying back with every fiber of my damaged soul to where I had been happy and contented. The lost paradise that was now opening up to me again. The untroubled world of mother and father. To my sisters, the smell of cleanliness. And at oneness with the god of Abel. Already on the day, following my short conversation with Demian, when I was finally convinced of my newly won freedom and had no fear of losing it again, I did what I had so often and so desperately wanted. And I confessed. I went to my mother. I showed her the money box with its damaged lock and filled with counters instead of money. And I told her how long I had bound myself through my own guilt to an evil tormentor. She did not wholly grasp my story, but she saw the money box, the change in my appearance, heard the change in my tone of voice and felt that I was cursed and restored to her. And now, with my heightened emotions, I underwent the ceremony of my readmittance to the fold, the prodigal son's homecoming. Mother took me along to father, and the story was repeated. Questions and explanations of praise were showered upon me. Both parents patted me on the back and breathed great signs of relief. Everything was marvelous, and everything was like the fairy tales. Everything was restored to wonderful harmony. I escaped into this harmony with real emotion. I can never be thankful enough at having regained my peace of mind and my parents' confidence. I became a model homeboy, played more than ever with my sisters, and at evening prayers I sang all the favorite hymns with the feelings of the homecomer who was saved. They came from my heart. There was nothing false about it. And yet, my house was not really in order. It was that fact alone that really accounted for my neglectful attitude towards Demian, for it was to him that I should have confessed. The confession would have been less exaggerated, less emotional, but much more fruitful for me. As it was, I was clinging with all my roots to my former earthly paradise. I had returned home and had been accepted in grace, but it was not Demian's world, nor was he suited to it. He too, though in a different way from Cromer, was a tempter, and moreover, my link with the second evil world with which I never wanted to have anything more to do. I could not and would not have been an Abel and glorify Cain now, and I myself had become an Abel. That was the greatest connection. The inner, however, was that I had escaped from Cromer and the devil's hand and not through any power and effort of my own. I had tried to tread the paths of this world and they had been too slippery for me. Now, as the grip of a friendly hand had saved me, I retreated to my mother's lab and the security of a pious and hedged-in childhood, without as much as a glance at the world outside. I made myself into someone younger, more dependent and childish than I actually was, and I had to replace my dependency on Cromer by a new one, for I was unable to walk alone in the blindness of my heart. I chose to be dependent on my mother and father, on all the familiar and such cherished world of light. I already knew that it was not the only one. If I had not followed this course, I had to stick to Demian and confide in him. That I did not want to do, and it seemed to me that this time on account of my justifiable mistrust of his strange ideas. In reality, it was entirely because of fear. For Demian would have been far more exacting than my parents. By means of persuasion, admonition, mockery, and sarcasm, he had done his best to foster an independent spirit in me. Alas, how well I realize that today. Nothing in the world is more distasteful to a man than to follow the path that leads to himself. And yet, six months later, I was unable to resist the temptation. And during a walk, I asked my father what one was to make of the fact that many people considered Cain better than Abel. He was taken aback and explained that this was an interpretation which was by no means new to our time. It was one that had arisen already in Old Testament times and had been taught among sects which included the Cainites. But this heresy was, of course, merely an attempt on the part of the devil to destroy our beliefs. For, if one believed in the right of Cain and the wrong of Abel, then it followed that God had committed an error, that the God of the Bible was not the true and only God, but a false God. In reality, the Cainites were reputed to have taught and preached something of the sort, but this false doctrine had long disappeared, and he was surprised that a school friend of mine should have heard anything about it. At all events, he warned gravely against me harboring such ideas. 
And that is the end of chapter two, Cain. As you can see, it was all about the Bible, guys, right? Come on, this is early 1900s. I love my Jesus. I thought these were Jews. What's going on here? I'm so lost. The he, what's the, the, the Muhammadite? Muhammadite? Golly. Anyways, uh, this is Sleepless Tales as always. We'll be continuing this soon. I think halfway through this reading, I started doing that YouTube sort of voice number 15 burger king foot i'm gonna i'm gonna put big effort i don't want to do that it's grody number 15 burger king foot lettuce it sound like that gross anyways um i'll catch you in the next part starting on chapter three and on my book page 52 um you have a great night this is sleepless tales as always don't forget to like comment favorite and subscribe okay goodbye <laughs>